Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again for series five, I believe, of Black Wealth Matters educational series. So today we're going to be learning all about um, colleges. So you guys, the the reason why we started the Black Wealth series around 2020 uh, was because my team and I, we were out marching and protesting the murder of George Floyd. And what happened was we, we really realized that there had to be a, a better way for us to um, contribute, especially being from the financial sector. And what I had started noticing uh, was that uh, if you look deeper, a lot of things that look violent or racist uh, have a financial uh, and they have a financial foundation of gain. It's usually where someone's gaining something financially and uh, Black folks are losing something financially. So uh, I wanted to explore that and I recruited my amazing team and they uh, helped me create the Black Wealth series and we've been doing it for over three years now. So thank you guys for coming. The series that we're working on now is all about college sports. I don't know what made us do this. I think what it was, was uh, my associate, Louis Aguilar, or Gilbert, as we call him. Gilbert had a fascination and a, um, a, a big, um, big heart and area of support for a coach in East LA named John Mosley. And he had been watching him on Netflix and then he decided he wanted to go out and meet him. So he uh, found the guy, met him in person and asked him to be a speaker on our Black Wealth series. So once we got him as a speaker, we built the entire series of sports around this Emmy Award winning uh, person in this show. And that's how the sports uh, series came about. But it's not because we didn't understand the um, importance of sports. I mean, we've all seen Governor Newsom in California talk about how the sports industry is going to change and how he's uh, going to pay athletes or athletes are going to be able to be compensated. So I thought that was a push in the right direction and I really wanted to understand more. So this series, you guys, is all about understanding more. So often people in low economic situations look at sports as a way out and it might be but there also needs to be some work done there. So before we start, you guys, uh, please make sure to introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A part. We will put them in the Q&A part. There will be uh, some questions asked of the speaker. And I'll just be fully transparent. I had to get the speaker yesterday, similar to what I have to do with some of my um, high power speakers, but I did have questions as of parents in the room live just so that I can make sure that the questions were as authentic and genuine as I can make them being that I'm not a parent and I don't have that understanding of a kid who's going to go to college. Uh, I also I also want to make sure that you guys are creating community with each other so please say where you're from if you have a business put that in there we'd love to support and let's get started. So I'm going to start. My name is Saria Rigo. I'm the creator of Black Wealth Matters educational series, and I have a team that helped me put it together. And our intention is really to uncover the correlation and connection between systemic racism and wealth in the Black community. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so guess what I just did? I just accidentally deleted out my um, presentations. Hold on one second. Yes, I did. Hmm. So what I want to talk to you guys today is a little bit about the financial sector, and then we'll go on to the other part. But let me just pull up my my uh, part. Hold on. I. It's all good. One second, you guys. So I consider myself to be very lucky for actually um, having the 
foundation of being in the financial sector. I actually didn't even know what the financial sector was when I uh, went to college. I had no idea about what it was, um, what it would do or any of that. So fast forward, now I know that finance is a very important uh, part of our, our world. Money is important, regardless of what someone says. So what I'm going to share with you guys is a little bit of what we do in terms of how we help families get from point A to B. And we have two ways that we help people get from point A to B. The first way is by helping them create their future with our opportunity. The other way is by helping them create their future with our savings. So you guys, this is going to be a quick and dirty. I'm going to put my contact information in there so that you can set some more time with me if you need to. But the main thing is this, you guys. Today, you're going to get some information. If you register for the series, which you had to if you're here, you're going to get more information. It's not just to keep this information to ourselves. The, the goal of this is to share the information, to have this series become so big and so popular that the information that we're having, uh, that we're sharing with our experts just becomes common knowledge. So think about who you know that can benefit from this, if you and your family can benefit. And then if you know anyone who's entrepreneurial that is interested in the financial sector. Our goal is to help people become more successful by helping them really create those soft skills, whether it's people skills, learning, coachability, entrepreneurial mindset, following the system. And the way the reason why that's important for us is because we know that those are the traits that aren't taught in school that also help create success. But then on the other side of the equation, we want to create generational wealth and we want to create generational wealth by helping people understand the financial fundamentals of money and how to manage it. So often we think that the way to solve a money problem is by having more money. Some of that's true, but we also have to understand what to do with the money once we have it, right? We've all heard of or seen stories where people have gotten windfalls of cash, small amounts, large amount, multi-million dollars amount, and they no longer have that. So we can help with that through planning and education. And our goal is to educate everyone and leave no family behind in that conversation. Another thing that we're doing is we're training people to be financial professionals with our amazing opportunity. Right now, there's such a big need for products and services. Uh, people need a, a system, a business. So often we have people with talent, people skills, but they don't have a system. So they end up really working themselves into uh, a burnout. We have powerful compensation because the financial sector is very lucrative. And then, of course, there's great timing. People want to know more about their finances, especially after 2020. And everyone's not influenced by money. For those people who aren't, for those people who really want to be in a place where it feels good, we want to help them too because we have great core values. Now, if you look at this screen, you're going to see a lot of discouraging numbers, like 59% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. They're not saying 59% of Americans, Americans who make 50000 or less. They're saying 59% of Americans, period, right? I remember hearing during... Uh, the Super Bowl that many of our uh, congressional leaders can't even qualify for credit cards because their credit is so bad because they filed so many bankruptcies, et cetera. So that living paycheck to paycheck does not, um, it has nothing to do with how much you make. It only Im is only impacted by what you do with your money. And these statistics get worse and worse. So we're trying to change that because we know that financial stress can impact our lives. And what makes us a different kind of company is that we're helping the middle income. Now, one of the things that I've learned from the Black Wealth Series is that in the Black community, the middle income is really that tide that lifts all boats. It really is, whether it's the Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, or the families, the Black families who were able to do well during Reconstruction. Um, I mean, there we can go on and on but it's the middle income that's able to share a little bit and give and, and help uh, create a better situation for most people. And it's not because um, they're wealthy, right? It's not that, it's really because they have, they're creating that financial independence where they're working because they wanna work, because, not because they have to. And what we wanna do present day in 2023 is create more of that I think it's an absolute shame 
that were sold this dream of work so hard until you turn 60, retire, and then have this amazing life. Let's have that amazing life now. So we're talking about our opportunity. And then we also help educate people. So in our first visit, when we're sitting down and we're helping clients plan for their future, we just educate them about basics of the financial sector, whether it's how the FDIC works. What happens if a bank goes out of business? How long do they have to pay you back? Do you know that? Uh, we educate them about how whole life companies work, um, how the tax strategies of a retirement account works. What's the difference between uh, diversified and um, a singular uh, portfolio or investment? So we want to make sure that people understand these basic concepts and then we go from there. We don't charge our clients for any of the work that we do. I'm going to give you guys quick education and then we're going to go on to our speaker. This is my favorite. This is the rule of 72. The rule of 72 is all about compound interest. So how it works is if you take 72 and divide it by the interest rate of whatever your investment is getting, it's going to give you a number. The number represents how many years it takes for your money to double, right? So if we're getting 2%, Let's say we were getting 2% at the bank. We are not, but let's say we were. That means every 35, every 36 years, our money's going to double. So if we start with 10,000 today, in 70 years, we're going to have about 39,000. Now, let's go up to 6%. At 6%, our money's going to double every 12 years. So if we start with 10,000 today, in 48 years, that 10,000 will go to 163. So often, because, uh, because we're not very clear about how the financial sector works, we opt out. We're like, you know what? I'm going to put my money in the bank. I'm not going to do anything with it. I'll just sit it there. The problem with that, I'll sit it there because it's safe. The problem with that is um, there's no safety, right? And the reason why is because in life, we have liabilities with our debt. We have credit cards, student loans, car loans, um, mortgages. And if we still don't have any of that debt, which some people don't, we have inflation. So if our money's not making money, we're technically losing it. And inflation and interest and all those things are not the worst thing that can happen. We also have some taxes. So without further ado, I would like to actually stop sharing because that brings me to the tax conversation with the uh, speaker that we're gonna have. So the speaker that we have coming up his name is Dr. Darvarian uh, Brown, and I was so excited to get Dr. Brown. And the reason why is because I had the pleasure of seeing him on one of the um, one of the shows, like a CSNBC or something like that. And I was just blown away by his conversation. So Dr. Darvarian, uh, Dr. Darvarian Baldwin is a leading urbanist, historian, and cultural critic. He currently serves as the Paul E. Rayther Distinguished Professor of American Studies and founding director of the Smart Cities Research Lab at Trinity College. Baldwin is the author of several books, most recently in the shadow of the ivory tower, how universities are plundering our cities, and is the text author of the world of the Harlem Renaissance, a jigsaw puzzle. He sits on the Executive Committee of Scholars for Social Justice and the National Council of the American Associates Association of University Professors. Baldwin also serves as a, as a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians and was just named as a 2022 Freedom Scholars by the Mark Reed uh, Casey Foundation. And he's very proud of that. So congratulations, Dr. Baldwin, for that. His opinions and commentary have been featured in numerous outlets for from NBC News, PBS, the History Channel, and USA Today, and the Washington Post, and Time. So without further ado, you guys, I'm just going to start us with Dr. Baldwin. One moment.
Dr. Baldwin, thank you so much for allowing us to jump into your very busy schedule. You have some amazing things happening that are not even in your bio. And uh, before you start sharing about your education and uh, what's going on in the college world, especially when it comes to sports, would you like to update us on some of the amazing things you have happening now? Yeah, thank you so much. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with your community. Um, it's always an a great opportunity to, to reach out and let each other know what we're up to. So this is really important. Um, yeah, so I've been doing a lot of work around um, kind of urban development in our communities and trying to advocate for more just relationships between our, our neighborhoods and, you know, government or nonprofits or the business sector. And so that work has been going on for a few, a number of years. And most recently, I was named a, a Freedom Scholar by the Margaret Casey Foundation, which acknowledges this work as a scholar activist. And so that offers a whole new platform, whole new networks. It's really a blessing. And I just feel honored because we don't do this for, we hope, I hope we don't do this for accolades or acknowledgement. We do it because it's right. And um, this is an opportunity to, to, that some people, they see us, they see what we're doing out here um, in the same way what you're doing. And so it's, it's wonderful when these things can be acknowledged and it can be a, a greater platform for the things that we do. Absolutely. And um, one of the other things that uh, you are involved with is the Scholars scholars SJ, is that what? Scholars for Social Justice, yes. Yeah, tell us more about that too. So I'm on the Executive Committee of Scholars for Social Justice. We started quite some time ago, probably around the story of Trayvon Martin, but then with the George Floyd scenario, the tragedy, actually, and I mean, let me say scenario, tragedy, and the uprisings that came and the mobilization that came in the summer of 2020, it really amplified our work. And that as scholars, many of us, we write about these things, we talk about these things, but not all of us actually do things, get involved. And so this was a group of my, myself and a group of other amazing scholar activists said it's time to jump into the fray to act to offer our services, our expertise, our networks, our insights, our time to serve social movements and also to activate and mobilize more politically just relationships on our own campuses at a national scale. And so that's probably some of the, mo the, the most, uh, the, I'm the proudest of that work with scholars, social justice, because it's a, it's a, it's a collection of amazing, uh, you know, men, women, non-binary folk who are just doing amazing work uh, that, uh, amplifies what I'm doing and also allows me to serve something greater than myself. Yeah, and I feel like uh, one, of, one of the things that, number one, that's needed, but one of the things that your book really makes clear is the fact that, number one, the universities, like Mitt Romney says, they're people too, and mm -hmm. they have personalities too, and they have biases too, and the fact that they're if left unchecked, they can just be the big problem. But it's good that you guys are in there because students have always been uh, activists. I don't know if the teachers have. So, have it's so, yeah. <laughs> so it's so good that you guys are in there because it's like all hands on deck. And I yes. think that's needed. Mm -hmm. So without uh, further ado, uh, Dr. B uh, Baldwin and Darvarian, I before we start, where are you originally from? I'm originally from uh, Beloit, Wisconsin, a small factory town, uh, hour north of Chicago. Okay, uh, I'm from Chicago. Okay. Oh, okay, so you know. Yeah, yeah we're, we have Wait. a lot of folks in here from Chicago. And even when I started reading and looking at everything that you're doing, the only thing I kept thinking about was the University of Chicago on 57. Of course. Of That's course. the only thing I was like. And then yeah. you, you just delve into it. So I almost thought you were from Chicago. Yeah, because, I mean, it's a second home. When I moved to New York yeah, over 30 years ago, um, I realized how much of a Midwesterner I was. I, I was running to get out of the Midwest, get to New York, realized I'm a Midwesterner. And so I kept continuing to refer everything back to Chicago as the, as the biggest city in my area. I've written distinctly about Chicago for 20 years. I came back to Chicago for this book. So Chicago is a second home for real. So yeah. Oh, good, 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 good. And what else about your family uh, drove you to education? Because that, that isn't necessarily in your bio. How did you know yeah. about college? What happened there? I'm first generation college, like many of us that are out there. Um, I'm a, I write a lot about the Great Migration. I'm a product of the Great Migration, like I'm sure your family is as well. Family came from Mississippi in the 50s. Uh, uh, you know, a collection of factory workers, domestics in the in the in the you know industrial cities. Um, 
But the great thing about my mother was single single mother uh, got her GED after having me. But she insisted. She's like, I don't know much about college, but I know you need to go there. So you know, tell me everything I need to do. So we did. We learned it together. So I will always be thankful for her. I, I just talked to her a few minutes ago. We'll always be thankful to her for not having the insight, but having the vision. If that makes oh, I love sense. That. that makes a hundred percent sense. Yeah, and so um, she created a pathway for me to do that, and um, I did that. Went to college, then went to graduate school in New York City, um, and stayed and staff stayed on the East Coast since then. Uh, but all my family, very much a Midwestern person. You're gonna, you might hear a couple of finners in the conversation. Yeah, ain't nothing wrong with it. Ain't nothing wrong. <laughs> but my East Coast folks, I say, what does that mean? What does finna mean? You know, so uh, I always got to show love uh, to the Midwest. And yeah, yeah, so that's that's my story. A child of the Great Migration, um, of factory factory workers and domestics, uh, first generation grad, uh, college graduate, first generation PhD, obviously. Yeah. Um, Proud, just proud to be able to connect and give and that and I carry that wherever I go um you know yeah. a lot of to be honest with you, you you'd be surprised how many academics actually black and white come from academic families I'm so not yeah and so <laughs> that's that was surprised me and uh -huh. so everywhere I go I carry that experience of the Midwest and particularly the working class Midwest with me everywhere, everywhere I go even though that's not me anymore um yeah. that's that's who that's what made me and yeah. uh, I don't I don't I don't stay silent about that yeah, I want to piggyback off of the great migration. So part of, uh, um, and I'm, I can wait till we get to the end to ask you this question, but part of um, me learning about history, I didn't understand the great migration at all. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what happened. All I knew was my grandmother couldn't read. And some of my some of her peers could read who were in Chicago at that time, but my grandmother couldn't read. And when I would ask her about it, she would just, you know, get ashamed and say, uh, we were in the fields and I didn't I was like, nope, slavery was over. I was, <laughs> like, yeah. in, my, in my mind, I was like, mm -mm, no, you were and uh, didn't realize that Mississippi. Yeah, they were. And uh, Mississippi was doing its own thing. Uh, and folks had to escape like a whole nother form of um, underground railroad. So that was one of the things that I've learned from this education uh, during the Black Wealth Series, which I'm so uh, happy about. And then, um, and we can save this, but, or we can ask it later, whatever you want, but it's, a, it's an important question. I want you to think about it a little bit. I've been noticing that the vision it's it's hard there's a there's a conflict with black parents of telling their installing a, or instilling a vision in their kids and also having them understand what's so right yeah. it's almost like the vision keeps them too grounded where they can't create that 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 opportunity to five because in their mind it's going to make them feel some type of way so i would love to know how you deal with it and address that as a scholar as a first generation black person and all of as that yes as a parent mostly so if you want to share that now or after but that's been a very important question and yeah. i think your expertise would really help with that conversation so let me think about it but um yes. i definitely will speak about it. i mean also what you said about the fields i mean my my grandmother was, you know, at a young age with a sharecropper, was the child of a sharecropper, my great grandfather. I, I remember her telling me stories in a very basic way. She was like, you know, when 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 my grandfather came courting for her, uh, you know, which, which is what they called it back then, right? Uh, to ask for her hand or what have you. Uh, my great grandfather said, Yeah, you can you can you can have her, so to speak, right? But you gotta wait till after the harvest season because she's my best cotton picker, right? So these, you know, we think this is ancient history. This is real. This is in our lifetime. I was the first generation born in the North. Um, and that's a big deal. Um, so these stories stay with us and they shape who we become today. So it's really important. I'm, I'm glad you asked those kind of, like, who are your people? That's what we used to say back in the day, right? When you, somebody, your friends come to your house, your parents say, who are your people? That's basically what you're doing. So I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, without uh, any more questions, sir, let me let you get to it. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen to begin uh, what I hope will be uh, a conversation that people will be interested in with Spark Conversation additionally. Um, the title of uh, my remarks for this time are universities are part of the problem yes universities are part of the problem so what about universities and what's the problem so let's just begin in in the one month of the ncaa basketball tournament what we call march madness 
the the NCAA as a nonprofit organization, yes, nonprofit, accumulates over one million dollars in media rights, ticket sales, corporate sponsorships, and television ads. But while this is powerful in itself, yes, one I'm sorry, one billion dollars in one month. While this in itself is a powerful kind of capture, a headline, what's not always discussed until recently is that all of this powerfully underwritten wealth is supported by the legal designation of the student athlete and the broader category of amateur status. What does that mean? Just a couple of years ago, during the pandemic, there was a campaign that ran pretty broadly, run by amazing black and brown students, particularly basketball players, called Not NCAA Property. As you probably all know, the highest revenue generating sports of basketball and football are overrepresented by young African-American males, who until the recent name, image, and likeness victories, uh, um, which only impacts the very high profile athletes, until then, none of them received any of the revenue, any of that $1 billion, just for example, um, that they have a central role in generating. Their labor powers this $1 billion cash grab, i.e., if it wasn't for the play on the court, there would be no revenue. So they created not NCAA property to advocate for better wealth and economic relationships between the talent and the labor on the court and the revenue generation and the front office of the NCAA and the related academic universities that benefit from their labor. Now, of course, you might hear the retorts. Well, they go to school for, you know, free, but it's not free. They get a free education. But I worked at a research, I I mean, at a a high profile uh, 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 university, Boston College, that had high profile sports teams, had basketball and football players in my classes, but it was only until after they quit the team or during the off season, because they tell you that they are relegated to very limited educational tracks and very specific educational opportunities that can be adjusted around their sports schedules. So while they have this NCAA designation of student athletes, they're athletes that just happen to take a couple classes. Their entire world is organized around the very wealthy and profit-organized realm of high-stakes sports, especially basketball and football. Many will also say that the NCAA operates at a deficit, that they don't make any money. They spend more money than they make. Yet, even what money are they spending? They're spending money on multi-million dollar contracts for coaches. Lucrative salaries for trainers, commentators, writers. The rest of the money goes into university budgets. And all of this remains underwritten by the amateur status of largely black male and increasingly black women athletes. A few years ago, noted civil rights historian who had no interest in sports, but took his civil rights vision and applied it to what was going on in the incident in college sports And he called this financial arrangement the shame of college sports. That's Taylor Branch. But really, this is the shame of higher education more broadly that has used its nonprofit status to not only target and exploit black male athletes, but also the communities that produce these human cash cows. How so? What do I mean by that? I want to focus your attention to one specific thing, sports stadiums. Now, what you see here is a professional sports stadium in Inglewood, California. But it is instructive for the broader implications of college sports stadiums as well in exploiting our community. How so? Many of these stadiums, professional and college, are positioned, are situated, are sited, in largely black and brown poor communities, like you see here in Inglewood. Their placement can activate a push for complementary development in the areas around commerce, retail, and housing. 
all celebrated as public goods for the existing residents. But, but years of construction disrupts the viability of small businesses that already are there. The new businesses that then enter don't cater to the needs or price points of longstanding residents. And the developments can also drive up property values and rental prices that push out the very residents such developments were touted to serve. So this is all underwritten by the property tax exempt status that colleges and universities hold as 501c3 nonprofits in the tax code. That status is extended to their sports stadiums. So ultimately, black and brown communities are actually paying for their own demise. How so, therefore, we must ask, ask how have schools, of all things, become this powerful driver of economic exploitation, specifically by plundering the very communities they claim to serve? This shame of college sports and their stadiums. To understand this, we must pull back and situate this experience within a bigger story. What's that bigger story? Right before our eyes, colleges and universities have become the biggest employers, real estate owners, healthcare providers, and yes, even policing agents in major cities and small towns all across the country. With this kind of influence comes the possibility that universities make cities and towns more vibrant places to work, visit, learn, and live. And from New York City's Cornell Tech on Roosevelt Island to Mesa's recent Arizona State University satellite campus, every small town and city wants to build a campus. Here is a picture of the Innovation Quarter in Winston-Salem, a mixture of biotech labs, green space, parking, classrooms, and recreation. This is an example of this desire of every town, every city to build out a campus. And to be sure, colleges and universities, they bring ideas and people together and generate jobs and new innovations, hence the Innovation Corridor. University developments often involve transformative commercial projects that are paired with stadiums, like USC Village in South Central LA, Cortex Innovation Center, affiliated with uh, Washington State. I'm sorry, this is uh, this is university. This is uh, let me just keep going. Um, Cortex, which is affiliated with Washington University in St. Louis. West Philadelphia's U City Square, Miami Converge in South Florida. And here is the living, learning, and play alleyway at the University of Cincinnati. The point here is that all in all these projects, we have seen higher education's growing control over the economic development and political governance in urban America or what I call the rise of universe cities. We tout this, we underwrite this, we pay for this, we celebrate this, we call for this. And in the process, higher education, in a world without factories, higher education has become big business. In our communities, they're company towns. But, but there is a cost for those living in the shadows of these ivy towers. Like the stadiums, Broader campus developments raise housing costs and displace residents in neighborhoods largely of color that surround these campuses. Higher education's broad control over labor can lower wage ceilings and suppress collective bargaining efforts. We think about higher education labor, labor, we think about faculty like myself, but the biggest labor force in higher education is the low wage labor of cafeteria workers, ground keepers, uh, support staff, uh, security teams, that's the primary work that happens on campuses and it's low wage and those workers come from the communities that surround the campuses that are being displaced as universities extend into these neighborhoods. Also, nonprofit university medical centers, they emphasize 
profitable boutique services, high profile research, or prioritize student services to the detriment of indigent care to the surrounding communities that they were supposed to be required to offer in exchange for their tax exempt status. And finally, campus police forces surveil and profile the very same residents and are rarely held to public account, especially at private schools. They are given jurisdiction. They are armed and they're given jurisdiction to police neighborhoods beyond the campus. And yet, because they're private schools, they are exempt from Freedom of Information Act laws. So they have public power as a private security force with no public oversight. And so they, their primary job is to surveil and protect all the wealth that's being seeded in these universities with healthcare research and services, with low wage labor, and with the expansion of this footprint with laboratories, classrooms, work sites, and yes, stadiums. So the question that you must be thinking about right now is what is going on? How did the city become a campus? Well, this story goes back at least to the 1950s. In this period, you had what we call white flight, which wasn't really white flight at all. Really what it was is that capital and wealth was allowed to leave to go to the suburbs and only white people were allowed to follow. But as this was happening, universities also tried to leave, especially city, universities in central cities, but they were too big to be able to move. So instead, they bunkered themselves down behind institutional walls or state funded demolitions. So as black and brown communities were moving to South LA, were moving to the South side of Chicago, were moving to Dixwell or New Harville in New Haven, were moving to Harlem in New York City, were moving to West Philadelphia, in, in, uh, obviously in Philadelphia, were moving to Overtown in Miami. As they were moving to these areas and there were universities in the area, the universities took federal and state money and demolish those communities and put in expanded footprints as a wall to buffer themselves from the growing black and brown communities. In the process, they began to call themselves anchor institutions. That as industry left the city, they became the economic engines to save the city from divestment. This was the case for about 30 or 40 years. But by the time we get to the 1990s, the children and grandchildren of those white folk that left to the suburbs began to turn inward or turn away from the suburbs. They were bored with 7-Elevens and miles of track housing. They wanted an urban experience. They might have gone to school in the city, or they might not have, but they wanted to uh, have a city life with live, work, play demands of waterfronts and jog parks and nightlife and concerts and walkability. So you began to see what was called the back to the city movement. And I lived this. I, I moved to New York City in the 1990s. And you began this. And this was a time period when Rudolph Giuliani was the mayor of the city. And you saw the city underwriting uh, uh, tech startups, converting warehouses into high-rise loft housing, underwriting uh, graphic design, web design, tech startup firms, and began to institute quality of life policing, arresting black and brown and poor folks for taking up more than one seat you know, the train, or for spending too much time in the vestibule, or for extra time loitering or squeegee boys. So you said, began to see cities trying to clean up the city to make way for this return to the city of empty nesters and young professionals. So on one side, you got cities competing with each other to bring in this tax base. On the other side, you got universities are facing shrinking contributions from the state to make themselves whole. And let's be clear. Whether you have a public university or a private university, these schools got money from the state and from federal government, either through direct grants or through indirect uh, resources from uh, uh, student, student loans. So that started to get it pulled back. And so universities were looking for other revenue streams. So what's happening here in the 90s? You have this period of interest convergence. You have, have cities competing to clean up their cities, to bring in a tax base from the suburbs, and you have universities looking for new revenue streams. 
So what you have at this moment is you have city leaders and university administrators beginning to turn to each other, and their idea is what would happen if we began to turn our cities into safe, profitable, and viable campuses? What would it mean to turn the city into a campus that would both benefit the profits of the university and the profits of the city? In this moment, you had press reports calling the ivory towers the new smokestacks of late 20th century urban America and late 20th century capitalism. In this moment, we have to bring to the center this notion of the knowledge economy. What is knowledge economy? Well, as the, the global north, because of course we still have factories. We still, our Gucci, our Louis Vuitton, our Chanel, our Prada, whatever, it's still our coach, it still has to get, gets, has to get made in a factory. But the factories are not in our cities in the US. So as factories moved to the global south, global northern areas had to develop new forms of economics. And at the center of this new economy was what I call knowledge. Well, what is knowledge? This knowledge economy. It's where academic research and labor are being used to create profitable goods and patents and experiences in a range of fields, from pharmaceutical industries and software products to health services, and yes, sports and tourism. Key to recruiting the best students, faculty, and their families to do this knowledge work is creating by creating an urbane cluster of laboratories, housing, retail, and recreation. So up on, up on the screen you have on the left, you have Bakery Square, and on that smokestack that was the old refurbished factory that was actually a bakery, you have Google. On the right, you have a re a design Harper Court, yes, in the on the south side of Chicago that people in the building we know about this, um, that combined retail laboratories, uh, housing, um, but in the middle of a historically black community. So these knowledge communities sit right in the middle of existing communities of color surrounding campuses where the land is relatively cheap and there is the less power for those communities to push back politically. These become safe, fake urban spaces to attract researchers, students, and their families right in the heart of what had one time been divested black and brown communities. So ultimately, the campus as an urban form has become a planning mechanism to build out what I call universe cities by turning neighborhood blocks into these fake urban spaces to maximize wealth extraction based on land control, labor management, and the privatization of political power. And at the center of this is also stadiums. Throughout the US, however, both citizens and politicians, especially during the summer 2020, have begun to rethink what makes all of this any good for the public, especially since the public is paying for it. So there have been growing reconsiderations in the areas of land, labor, and policing. Today, I want to focus on the area of land because it most simply brings together the issue of stadiums. Higher education, colleges and universities, they have become the biggest landholders in their cities. What's the good? Off the top, we presume that schools are an inherent public good, most clearly marked by their 501c3 property tax exempt status. But this nonprofit designation is precisely what allows for an easier transfer of public dollars into higher education's private developments with little public scrutiny. So basically, their tax designation as an educational institution has turned into a financial shelter for the institutions, but also for their private partners in pharmaceutical work, in biotech work, in health services work, and in sports, in the NCAA. These schools pay virtually no taxes on their increasingly urban footprint. Yet they reap the benefits of city services like snow removal, trash removal, infrastructure, the electrical grid, 
while residents face increased property taxes if they own homes in the areas or rentals, renters, it face increased housing costs because property values are increased with these new developments that are underwritten with the tax exempt status of the institution. A perfect example of this in the background of this of this slide is the neighborhood, historically black neighborhood of Witherspoon Jackson. In the late 2000s and teens, they began to realize, they said they, they saw that, wait a minute, their property taxes, these are all homeowners, their property taxes were going up, and yet there were very few improvements in the infrastructure of their neighborhoods. How could this be? The residents began to conduct some research. They realized that they sat right next to Princeton University buildings that were reaping millions in royalties and patents because of the relationship that they had with the multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly that was conducting research in those buildings that was being covered by Princeton University tax and status that was reducing overhead for Eli Lilly and then was coming back to the university in the form of patents and royalties in these tax exempt buildings. And yet the pro property taxes of the residents was going up with very few to no improvements. In 2016, they sued Princeton University and won an $18 million lawsuit for their losses. One resident was so disgusted by the debauchery and deception that he found in this nonprofit institution that he dismissed Princeton University as a hedge fund that conducts classes. Probably perhaps the most egregious example of these arrangements are in states like Arizona, where real estate is the wild, wild west. Arizona State University has gone, even this is a public university, they've gone to realize that because they sit on tax exempt land, they can lease out their land to any company that was willing to sit on the land. So on the screen here you have the largest development in the state of Arizona, the regional headquarters for state farm insurance. And it's sitting on Arizona State University land tax free. What did Arizona State do? They charged state farm insurance a, 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 a smaller rate than what it, state farm were paying taxes. But the power is that the money that gets directly paid to the university, the university can then pay, use it to do whatever they want to it, like build out sports stadiums, uh, hire NFL coaches like Herm Edwards and pay them an NFL salary without the oversight of the state legislature, which is supposed to be how a state university works. Any cost, any charges they put out there is supposed to go over the oversight of the state legislature. But Arizona State found this loophole that if they transfer their tax and status to private companies and then charge them a slightly short, smaller fee, that supersedes the oversight of the state legislature. So you have this arrangement here. You also have things like Novus Innovation Corridor, which is also a state, state is at Arizona State University. They use the money that companies like Arizona that State Farm pays. And they also use the money because they also sit on their land, a retirement community, fully profit oriented. This retirement community, the profits from the, from the retirement community and the State Farm Insurance headquarters then go to build out innovation corridors like Novus. It's a combination of retail, high luxury housing, not for students, but for residents and the workers in this community. Stadiums, yes, stadiums and laboratories this is the new hustle all underwritten by the higher education tax exempt status this is preposterous this is horrible but again there are other ways to do this there are other ways of thinking about these relationships for that i went to the university of winnipeg in winnipeg canada they offer us a different way of doing campus expansion, including the stadiums and recreational spaces. Um, in the 2000s, the first, the first to be clear, they did this not out of the goodness of their heart. 
they realized in order to survive in the higher education marketplace, they had to pivot based on their particular conditions. So this is a great lesson for what's happening in higher education in the U.S. as well. So in the 2000s, uh, the University of Winnipeg faced a demographic shift. Before that, their target audience was suburban white families that could be full payers of tuition and room and board. But in the 2000s, those families began to turn away from the university to go to other schools because they could go, were more competitive because those families were having fewer children. Those white families were had, having babies. And so they became more competitive for, I guess, better competitive schools. So schools that were pre previously commuter schools at the University of Winnipeg began to shift and turn towards the residents in their surrounding area, which were First Nation, i.e. indigenous communities and lower income, what they call new Canadian or what we call immigrant communities. They took on, they became the greater influx of students at the university. But they realized that in order to service this new demographic, they would have to change their higher education business model. Because the students that were coming now were low income, they were adult, and they had children. And they were from non-white communities. So in order to service this new demographic, they built out things like this that you have on your screen, the downtown commons. The downtown commons is a housing complex that has four rates of housing. Premium rate, which are the 12 balconied build, uh, uh, units you see. Market rate, affordable rate, and rent, rent, rent geared to income rate. The pre and these are all these facilities are open to both students and to residents in the city of Winnipeg, hence the downtown commons. But the beauty of this is that the premium rates, the only difference they have is the balconies. And the revenue generated from the premium rate units is used to underwrite the other three rates of housing. When you come into this housing, you all the units except for the premium rates are exactly the same. So you don't know if you're moving into a market rate or rent geared to income rate. On top of that, if you cannot, if your family cannot afford Wi-Fi, all the common areas have free Wi-Fi. And then because it will be including a largely indigenous or First Nations community, the, the pipe, the ventilation systems have been retrofitted so the common areas can allow native communities to engage in indigenous smudging practices. So this housing complex is designed to meet the needs, not just of the university, but to meet the needs of the community for which the university will be pulling their students and their families. On top of that, here you have the University of Winnipeg Stadium and Recreational Complex. Now, let's be clear. It was built in the 1980s. And this area, this back of the stadium, is actually facing the community and the community for 20 years was outraged by the audacity to drop down a stadium and to have his back facing the community. But through social unrest, through protests, through negotiations, what the university did do is they entered into an agreement with the community called a community charter. What is a community charter? A community charter is an arrangement between the community and the university for the use of this building in prime hours during the day by the community. So not at eight in the morning and 12 at midnight, but this charter is legally binding that gives the community peak hours of use of a university facility to compensate for the travesty of building this in the middle of the community and making it back facing. Is this perfect? No, but this is a concession that the university is understanding who will be its community, who will be its demographic, who will be its students in trying to address the needs and be a institution for the community and not just in the community. This is instructive because as the U.S. is also facing demographic shifts, white families that can full pay are no longer having children. And the, the biggest demographic of those people that can go to college are what we call Pell eligible, financially eligible students, which are primarily immigrant, black, brown, and low income. U.S. universities are also going to have to pivot in the very ways that you saw at the University of Winnipeg, not just out of the goodness of their own heart, but in order to survive in a new higher education marketplace. 
And I would say that because the wealth in the stadium realm is coming not just from black and brown athletes, but from the taxes that the universities aren't paying in these black and brown communities, University of Winnipeg can be instructive for U.S. universities and stadiums as well. So all this whole experience we're talking about, it has driven me to not just write about books, but to be about change. And so with this, I built out what I'm calling my Smart Cities Lab that has become both a, a, a knowledge database and advocacy group for university partners and community, and community partners to enact change for better relationships between communities and nonprofits and their cities like universities. So at the Smart Cities Lab, we research and consult on best practices for building out equitable urban communities with a specific focus on university-driven development. Our tagline is that the smartest cities develop without displacement. Smart doesn't just mean technology and infrastructure. Smart means sustainability and community and sustainability for the community that currently exists in, in, in those areas. So through this lab, I have joined with communities across the country, from New Haven, Connecticut, to Chicago, from Berkeley, California, to Miami, to build out in real time more equitable relationships with local universities and urban partners. We specifically focus on the campus and its insatiable expansion in us as our primary site of struggle. We have been victorious in New Haven, helping organize campus labor and community groups to push Yale to provide additional millions to the city for its increased portfolio of tax exempt properties that suck life from the city budget and specifically from public schools. Our artists came together two years ago to put this wonderful art piece on the streets. The, the, the red bar indicates Yale's contribution to the city in what we call a pilot, a payment in lieu of taxes, which amounted to, at the time, about $14 million, which is important. It's good. But then we compare that to the blue stripe that goes all the way down to the end of the block, which accounts for Yale's $40 billion endowment. So the point was, Yale, you can do more. So through a years and years and years of advocacy, I wrote, we wrote op-eds in local papers. We wrote pieces in Time Magazine. We hit the streets. We galvanized. We pressured politicians. We collectively organized with community groups and residents. We pushed Yale to contribute an additional $10 million a year for the next six years. Still a drop in the bucket, but it sets the precedent that universities do all responsibility of tax relief to the communities in which they sit because their prosperity is built out based on the money they're extracting from these neighborhoods. We're also working with residents in the Black Bottom community of Philadelphia, who are still suffering from university-led demolition projects from the 1960s, where the university had promised that in exchange for moving into the Black Belt community, as you see on the left, that they would have, as you see, the darker shaded blocks were supposed to be affordable housing units so that residents would be able to stay. So again, development without displacement. The university and the city never lived up to its promise. So now there is currently a battle to preserve the UC townhomes, the last and only piece of low-income housing in this university area as the area is being washed over with pharmaceutical companies, security teams and firms, uh, biotech companies, high-end housing that want to be near the university because of the prosperity that was made possible because of these historic demolitions. So the fight is ongoing as we speak, and we are at the center and part of that struggle. So more broadly, the research lab has assessed the what we call town gown, campus city relationship across the country. And it brings us to a series of logical conclusions, especially when related to the land grabs and the land exploitation that comes with what we could call the sports industrial complex of stadiums and athletes. So collectively, we call for what we call payments in lieu of taxes to compensate for the tax exemption of universities and their related developments. We call on schools 
to reserve a portion of their tax exempt status and their endowments and the revenue from sports stadiums for community projects and a transfer of investment from money market accounts to community serving financial institutions. We call on schools to attach a community benefits agreement to any campus expansion project. And these CBAs can include affordable housing mandates, zip code specific jobs, job training, scholarships, and direct access to campus spaces. We insist on the build out of community based zoning and planning boards with enforcement powers for all higher education developments. So therefore, if a expansion of university expands into our communities, we want to have legally enforceable planning and zoning boards that will have oversight over the merits and the benefits and the equity of these developments. And we insist that all campus developments like the recreational facility in Winnipeg be governed by a community charter. We watch schools throw away food daily in their cafeterias and in these stadiums. And we demand that they package the food into healthy meals for communities of need. Finally, we call for the divestment of campus police and the investment in teams of preventative outreach and trauma care alongside investments in housing and food security that can actually reduce harms greater than armed security guards. Ultimately, a discussion about the university, its expansion, and the host neighborhoods must come to terms with how much higher education extends into people's lives in ways that have nothing to do with teaching classes. Just considering the sports stadiums alone, college and universities are massive development projects, real estate deals that benefit architects, construction companies, and related contractors. They bring significant financial gain to coaches, media companies, advertising firms, commercial products, sports apparel companies, writers, and producers. Our people, black and brown folk, come to the party on the back end as the low wage servers in the stands or the free labor entertainment on the floor. And these wealth generating behemoths are situated right in the middle of our communities, raising living costs while siphoning public dollars away from our very existence. This is a financial arrangement that must end now. We must free ourselves from the myth of the schoolhouse. These campuses have become sites of much broader struggles over things like neighborhood displacement, equitable labor conditions, intellectual property rights, and wealth redistribution. And we are just here watching as the wealth comes in with our noses pressed to the glass, wishing that the prosperity would extend to our neighborhoods. But it's in these same halls, in these stadiums, in these cafeterias, in these alleyways, that we have the building blocks to set the foundation for a different path. We can reclaim these cafeterias, reclaim these hallways, reclaim these classrooms, reclaim these stadiums, and make them serve the public good of just and equitable development in the ways that I've outlined. Another university and their stadiums, another pathway is possible. Listen, one of the primary claims of higher education, whether it be on the sports field or in the stadium, is to serve the public good and to solve the world's greatest problems. So we follow that claim to its logical conclusion, then why wouldn't we start by addressing the university's hands in creating problems in their very own backyards? Thank you. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. All right. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, let's start with um, the first question, which was, uh, what, would, what do you say to kids? How do we educate our, or do we, or do we not? Yeah. I mean, first, I think one thing that's happened, and it wasn't for a good reason, I think cause, because universities were trying to exploit the kids, but college is not for everybody. No, it's not. And it doesn't mean, not, not in capacity, but in terms of like, it, it's a specific kind of learning. And so 
there are some people who don't learn that way. They need to be in the field. They need to be in trade programs. They need to be in internships. They need to work with different kind of jobs. Mm-hmm. So first of all, there's that. Mm-hmm. So we should not just be sending our kids to slaughter if they're not really built or their learning is not organized around the college experience. Okay. That's number one. Okay. Number two, the point that we must maintain and, and, and hold all the time is that if these institutions, we need to teach our kids what I'm talking about. Like, what are the economics behind these institutions that claim to have nothing to do with economics? We have to teach our kids financial literacy. Now, in the, in the prosperity churches, what that means is just Bentleys, Benzes, and Beamers, and living a good life. That's not, and I'm no no shade on TD Jakes, whoever. That's 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 cute. That's fine, but that's not what I mean by financial literacy. <laughs> what I mean is a is a deep tissue economic analysis of how economic conditions affect your life. Mm-hmm. How do you save? How do you understand financial platforms? How do you read a budget? Um, uh, uh, how do you understand the economic implications of things that are claimed to have nothing to do with economics? That's what I mean by financial literacy. It doesn't just mean uh-huh. trying to get a gold chain or the next Louis Vuitton bag. That's not what I mean. Yeah, it really sounds like understanding the paper trail, which is why I started the Black Wealth Series, because I didn't realize how much of systemic racism is affecting our wealth. And this is just a prime example. It affects right. wages, property uh, rates, your taxes. like. Yeah. So many things from an already low, um, you know, historically lower pay rate, and then right. going down because the lowest wages. Old, yeah, the lowest wages because this big old, you know, plump university is just sitting there, it's sucking Fighting <laughs> wealth from you, and te- and telling you to be happy about it. Yeah, and that's, the, that's what as a, as a faculty member, that's what really excuse me, that's what pissed me off is that this is being done in the in my name as a faculty member and. And, and I felt like I had to do something. People say, you know, you know, don't you fear getting fired or don't you, you know, how dare you bite the hand that feeds you? But I do this from a position of love that I, I believe in the university mission of making the place better. And why wouldn't I, if I in your if you're in a workplace, wouldn't you want your workplace to be the best it could be? So I do this from a position of the, for what I consider to be the highest love. In the church, we call it agape love. The highest love is from which I do this work. And so that's my position. I think you're absolutely right. I do activism because I love America and I know right. it's better. Like right. acknowledging someone's flaws or industry flaw doesn't mean you don't love it. Nothing's right. perfect, but we can fix it. We can, right. especially that. Uh, one of the participants is saying, what do we do to increase wages in the communities without putting families in debts uh, yeah. through the university, like with student loans? No, it's a great question. So right now, I, as a part of Scholar Social Justice, in my own work, I'm a part of the, I'm affiliated with the Debt Collective, which is created, a, so basically unionized. Union, unionization is critical. We've made, we've been taught to believe since Reagan, Ronald Reagan, that unions are a dirty word. They are, they are the solution when it comes to wages and collective bargaining. No question about it. Um, and this is why sports, this is why professional sports have unions. Let's be clear, right? But just to get to the real point here. So I'm a part of this organization called the Debt Collective and they created a debtor's union because what was happening for years is that when schools were making less money, they were further exploiting students with student debt, with student loans that they could not, that they knew they couldn't pay. And so you even have for-profit companies and they were putting, they were garnishing the wage of the poor black people, black and brown folks. And so through the debt collector, they're like, well, our wages are already being garnished. So we're just, we're just not gonna pay the wage. We're not gonna pay, pay back the unions. And they created debtors unions. And they were able through these unions to get these companies to cancel and to forgive their, their, their exploitative loans. That's what happens with collective organizing. On the other side, I'm a member of the American Association of University Professors. For so many years, I didn't really want to rock with them. I felt like it was very white. It didn't really speak to my needs. But as things began, the exploitation increased and increased. I'm like, you know what? This is the only way we can save ourselves is, is through unionization. And it's, it's a version of a, of, a, of a faculty union. And now I'm on the national advice on the national council. I'm a member of the national leadership team because this is my, how can I talk about these things and not step up to be at the center of organizing? And they understood that we had been insular and just trying to protect faculty and it was failing. So because of the work that I do, it's like talking about the broader world of faculty and universities, you got to bring in the students. You got to bring in the low wage workers. You got to bring in the host communities. That's the only way faculty are going to save themselves. And this is the only way we're going to increase wages 
fight for better conditions. Because let's look at workers for a minute. As workers begin to union, low wage workers, workers begin to unionize our campuses. What do schools do? They don't allow them to unionize. They they champ down on unions, or if they do unionize, they begin to subcontract the work. So they would bring in an earmark or a wolf yeah. security or what have you. And so then even when you secure a union contract as a subcontracted employee, that doesn't apply to you. So we got to also understand how these institutions, they're educational industries, but especially in today's knowledge economy, they are the biggest businesses in our cities, not Madison or you or Davis, California or Charlottesville, Virginia, or, you know, some other college town. I'm talking about Chicago, New York, Miami, LA. These schools are the biggest players in the game. And you have to understand them in that way on the, on the wage scale, on the land scale, on the policing scale, on the healthcare scale. So that's, that's my position. Okay, I have another question. It says, due to the establishment of universities in urban areas, typically home property values have increased, thus creating home equity. Should properties in these communities be sold? Can it help to establish and con contribute to creation of generational wealth, specifically in communities of color? Yeah. I mean, the problem is that, you know, we are, we are already under under resourced wealth wise, so it can it can take black and brown folk a whole generation, maybe two, to actually buy a house. Yeah. And then because of the history of redlining, the same house with the same building materials can be worth half. Yeah, I was just in St. Louis this past weekend. This thing called the Del Mar Divide, mm -hmm. the very same houses on the different sides of the street called Del Mar are have a two hundred thousand dollar difference. Right. So you take your whole life to save and buy this house and you and you and you and you build it out and you're on a fix. And by the time you, you, you secure it, you're on a fixed income for the property values. Mm -hmm. And then the university is raising property values all around you and you can't afford increased prop, uh, uh, mortgages. Or, I'm sorry, increased property tax, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do? So in Chicago, on the south side in Woodlawn and other places, you know that well, because you're from the south side from Chicago. Mm -hmm. the, uh, they're organized because when the Obama library moved to Woodlawn, property value skyrocketed. You know, we love us some Obama, but let's be clear, when that library moved there, it did damage to the community. So those communities began to organize and create a community benefits coalition to make sure that for the developments that they can secure, they can put a, a hole, a cap on, on, uh, on uh, property taxes for long-term residents that they would could ensure that with any new development that affordable housing at a, a real affordable rate could be not 120 percent ami right average median income but 40 percent ami that's what we actually make in those communities could would be included in those developments but that came because of organizing and, I, and we work with those communities so that's the kind of literacy and engagement through collective action and financial literacy that you got to have in order to sustain and fight in this new economy that's amazing. That's amazing. And it, I mean, that's amazing. One of the other things that um, I wanted to ask, who is this benefiting exactly? So who are these dollars going to? And my theory is that um, any industry uh, in America can be weaponized if there's a culture of anti-Black. Any industry, right. having that's babies, right. teacher, like anything, a bakery, anything, <laughs> anything yep. can be weaponized if there's a, a anti-Black. Mm -hmm. and that's what's happened with these institutions after you know in the 60s and 70s when we mobilized to get into them mm -hmm. uh, it's at the very same moment that you started having uh uh student loans mm -hmm. or that schools were free yeah in, in california and in new york state public higher education was free yeah but as soon as you start entering into them they became you start, start having student loans that's that's not disconnected Right. Oh. But in the contemporary moment of the knowledge community, the knowledge economy, you have, you know, let's be clear. Universities had to monetize or become entrepreneurial because they were not getting money from the state. Like I said that earlier, they were they were looking for new revenue streams. So this money helps to sustain them without this money from the state. But the exploitation piece. Yeah. Right. Benefits their coffers. So you, if you're sitting on a 40 billion dollar or even a 10 billion dollar endowment, you're not going to spend that in the lifetime of your institution. So you're just wealth hoarding. Yep. So the money goes or it benefits investors. So say you build out an expansion and, you, and your board of trustees are made up of real estate moguls, construction company moguls, uh, uh, loan company. This is the truth at NYU a few years ago, loan company moguls. And so you have this captive market and you're building out. So construction, student loans, 
that money is going to the shareholders and to the companies based on the board of trustees. Rent. I mean, this is some straight up gangsterism. It's the board right? of trustees that are the money trust. That's the. But it also it also go, but it, and their companies. Yeah. It, it also goes to the private companies that sit on these campuses. Yes. That Makes are sense. part of that financial shelter. Yeah. So, so you got like a Google or a Bombardier or General Motors. They can contribute money, say, at MIT or Carnegie Mellon Tech Schools to do their primary research. So they ain't got to pay for research work. They can have grad students do it at a low rate and then write it off at the tax benefit, right? They get the same level of research and development from graduate workers for a, 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 a fraction of the rate. And they get to write it off as educational cost and an educational contribution. This is a straight, this is straight up what we would call this is pimping. Right? Yeah. This yeah. Is straight up pimping. Yeah. And people need to understand that. And, yeah. it's, and, it's, and it's and it's really it's primarily targets black and brown women. Yeah, yeah, because there's less of a voice there too. Now let's get back to the sports part. So yeah, sure, one sure. billion dollars, Dr. Brown, uh, Do, Dr. Bauman, in one month. Right. And so when I heard about the when Governor Newsom, or me, you know, when he said that a few years ago, athletes are going to get paid, I was like, that is awesome. My thinking is they're going to split the proceeds from the door. Right. <laughs> they were going to give these athletes like just like regular, like basic thing. And they're going to give these athletes a little piece of the proceeds. Had no idea. They were like, no, you're going to get paid from your name and likeness. And then I'm yeah. like, where's the money from the door going? I know it's not going to the teachers. I know it's not going to the taxes. I know it's not going to students and reducing right. their like college is that compared to a billion dollars a month. Are right. you kidding me? You can give them five scholarships for that. So what um, what do you think would be a fair thing to do? And yeah. anything else you want to piggyback off that? But what, do you, what do you think is a fair way to pay athletes for their contribution? I think just pay them from the door. But that's just me. I'm weird. What do you nope, think? Nope. I, I, most, a lot of people don't. They're like, these are athletes. You're corrupting their sports. Their sports. They're workers. They're workers. Right? Mm -hmm. and, just, and as I said before earlier, when I have athlete, high profile athletes in my classes, it's only as they quit the team or or sometimes in the off season because they their primary job, it's clear in the classes they select and the lifestyle they live is to be there to play that sport. That's what they're there for. Right. And so even you may you make a great point. So name, image and likeness is a great reality. But you know what what that was in response to? It was response to because some athletes were beginning to talk about sports unions. Good. Oh, they so, keep but, but the point is that name, image, yeah. and likeness was the small concession That's to it. cut off what was becoming a galvanization of unionization. And what it does is, is that, again, as, as you all know, the name, image, and likeness dollars don't even come from the NCAA. It comes from the corporate partners. So that billion dollars is not even touched by this so-called concession. They're conceding uh -huh. nothing. Nothing. Oh, so they still need to unionize. Right. They still need to use because nice. image of life only really benefits high profile players who actually have a platform beyond the sport. Yeah, absolutely. Based, based on hilarious. performance. And yeah, well, name, image, and likeness. The other thing is about name, image, and likeness. Uh, did you just say it's not based on performance? No, it's, not, it's, it's based on their, 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 their popularity, their, right? Their popularity, their social media presence, right? Yeah. Their, their looks, their yeah. looks. Yeah. It's also going to adversely affect black and brown folks because we're not as we're not conventionally seen as beautiful or attractive in the in the marketplace. Right. So it's like the 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 the, the short the little cute little blonde gymnast at LSU, they're going to get the bulk of the money. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I didn't even think about that. So unions are very important, and we need to right. kind of go back to that conversation. Well, so organize whatever you want to call it, organized labor that allows us to come to the table as a collective force, whatever you want to call it. What, I, what, uh, I, wear a union, whatever, whatever word you want to use. What's wrong with you know, union? <laughs> nothing, but some people get, fun, you know, the, the, the political right has done a good, a good job making it a, a dirty word. Oh, know? yeah, they do that to everything. Right. <laughs> they do that so, to so I would stuff. just say, what's the yeah. responsibility? So if you're making a yeah. billion dollars a year, you know, we can't have no NAACP, NCAA CARES program where you're giving us a few scholarships here and there. That's a fraction because also this money is tax exempt because of the NCAA. Right. So that's a that's a fracture. So we need scholarships. We need direct access. We need actual like whole housing developments. Right. Affordable housing developments 
ne right next to these stadiums if we're going to build stadiums in our communities. Absolutely. We need, we need uh, a living wage jobs to work in these stadiums. We yes. need athletes to get a wage. And even if you say, okay, they're gonna, they're gonna, they don't have the financial literacy to use the money today. Even though you wouldn't say it to a golfer who and starts that's not right. That's not that's, that's not right to or say. A tennis that. player who yeah. starts playing at, at fifteen. But even if you say that, so put the money in a trust and let it create, let it run escrow for the four years of their college, and then pay them a payout after their four years or after they no longer pay. Because let's also be clear. This is this is so slimy, and what we what, in the hood what we call this is so shiesty that 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 athletes are placed on a year to year contract. They don't get one. They don't get four year scholarships, and what that does is it protects the university from having to pay out over over the full four years. So if you get hurt, if you leave the team, you're only or if if, if your performance is not up to par what they want. They have each year. This is like a lease. This is like a for those that have rentals. It's like a lease. This is like a month to month, right? Month to month yeah. rental. Yeah. This is how our, our black young men and women are being treated, and yet they bring all this revenue to these these multi billion dollar behemoths. So yeah. all of that's got to be renegotiated. Yeah. So those of you who are black and brown that are listening, that are accountants, that are lawyers, yeah. that are agents that are planners, y'all need to be working on, we need to get together collectively as black professionals and start renegotiating this landscape. That's what our power and our expertise is for. This We're is down. I, listen, the thing that I love about this series is that we get to hear everyone in their own corner talk about what's needed. And unfortunately, the way that America works is we can't just have one leader because that'll get sniped out by our government because we haven't advanced past that uh so if we have different people in their corners i think yep. i think people are coachable we just don't have a coach That's so right. one of my, the things I'm, I'm the visioner i'm a big scale person bringing these things together i don't have accounting skills i don't have financial skills to that degree but i know how to bring people together to see the vision yes. we, well, we got you we got you and um would it be safe to say that people should follow your scholars sj or what do you recommend people follow yeah, follow me on twitter at the baldwin my email, Devarian Baldwin at trendcall.edu. Okay. Uh, my, my lab just started, so we, I could, so you know, web designers hit me up. We're trying to build out, out a web web page to get this thing up and popping. We're doing the work now. I'm trying to catch up on the social media side. Yeah. To to, to to catch up to the work, but the work is being done. We're in community. We out there. We in Berkeley. We in Miami. We in New Haven. We in Philly. We doing the work. Um. So. <laughs> Let's build. Let's grow. Yeah. No, we'll absolutely help you in whatever we, way we can. I think that is um, it. And um, what else did I want to say? Uh, oh, you were saying that people, you know, people are afraid that these kids will be irresponsible with their uh, money. It's a financial institution. Teach them. Right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> How about that? How about that? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a university. Just teach them, you know, if you uh, if you could. Right. So if you, if you want to, that's if you want to, you know, yeah. are there benefits to them being financially literate? That's the question. Right. Absolutely. And that's the reality because of systemic racism. It's easy to take advantage of people when they have a lot of money. Uh, right. And, and don't know what to do financially. It's easier to have these predatory financial professionals, these predatory accountants. I think Rihanna sued one of her predatory accountants and one. So, uh, no, we'll definitely be following you. Now, the last question is, uh, you answered it, but I didn't hear. Is it a smart idea to have a conversation with your kid about their race? Or is that something we need to? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, if you don't have a conversation with your kid about their racial identity and racial experience, this, this is for both, not actually for both uh, uh, black and non-black, but white people too. If you don't have that conversation, because we live in a society so organized by race, the world will tell, tell them who they are in a way that's to the world's benefit and not to yours. So, you know, whether you want to call it the talk or just talking about identity or family lines, family trees, a part of who we are is our racial identity because it, it profits it profits society. It profits the world. So why would you not want it to profit you? Mm -hmm. But also it's about it's about self-esteem. It's about family lines. Who are you in the world? We said earlier, who are your who are your people? Right? So even if you aren't talking about black and white, who raised you? What are your traditions? What are your legacies? What are your strengths and values that will protect you and bear you up in times of crisis and challenge? 
And the fact that though, many of those things are shaped by your racial experience is not a small it's not a small part of the story. Why would you want to hide from that? Yeah. And what about your mom? What did your mom tell you? She told me a lot. I mean, but you know, her thing was more so like she never forced me to live to her limits. Mm -hmm. This is really important for families, for, for parents. I'm a parent of three boys. And even though I've been successful, there are still things, ways I see the world that they don't see the world. They grew up with, with, with the idea that a black president is possible. I didn't grow up like that. So there are ways in which I have limits on my vision, the way I see things, suspicions that I have, that I cannot pass down to them. I can give them knowledge and value and have them be aware of things that I've seen, but I cannot pass down to them my fears. And so that's something that my mother never did. The things that she never saw, she never limited my capacity based on what she could, what she didn't know. Love that. And that, to me, that's the greatest gift she could ever give, the greatest gift you could ever give to a child. Okay, awesome. All right, sir, we have taken so much of your time, and thank you so much. I know you have a shooting tomorrow, and I know yes, the I entertainment do. world, you might not be able to share, but <laughs> thank you. Hulu, keep watching Hulu. It's coming. Uh, it's cool. Hulu? Okay, perfect. We, can Hulu. We, can, we, out, we out here. We out here. We'll be looking at your social media <laughs> as you as you prep it up. Everyone's saying thank you. Thank you so much. Have an amazing rest of the day. I'm going to stop the recording thank now. So All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You guys, hello. I think that, um, thank you so much. His presentation went a little longer than uh, most of them, but it was so good and it was some great information that we need to know. Moving forward, you guys, at least we understand. We're learning to see the system and how it works so that we can counteract it. So you guys have been amazing. You stayed on. I don't think we lost not one person. So thank you so much. Make sure to register. Uh, make sure to share, you guys. We need uh, your help. Uh, if you can, share the series with your friends, with your family, with your community. Have them register right now. The next speaker uh, is going to be Coach John Mosley from Netflix's Emmy Award winning show, Last Chance You. Thank you, Gilbert, for that connection. And we're going to have just more people uh, after that. So each series is on the first Thursday of the month. Make sure you can get in and, and share the information. Thank you, guys. The book was called In the Shadow of the Ivory Towers, How Universities Are Plundering Our Cities. Read it. And you can also follow, uh, find him on YouTube, Dr. Devarian Baldwin. Find him on YouTube. He's done so many interviews. You'll get even more great information. But $1 billion, one month. All right, you guys, have an amazing rest of the day. Bye.